Hey, what's up, everybody? How's it going? Hey. Oh, hey. Hey, hey. Last week, I looked over here, and I was like, dude, this place is packed. And then I looked over here, and I was like, where is everybody? And now it's kind of like flip-flop. Like, everybody's over here. Were you guys, like, crowded last week, so you tried to switch sides, but everybody had the same idea? That's cool. I just was curious. I was curious. So, hey, I am so excited to be here tonight. I love, like, this is my favorite thing that I do is to just kind of get here, uh, hang out with you guys, chat about some issues, you know. And uh, we're starting a new series tonight called Canceled. Uh, so no, church isn't canceled. Uh, school is not recanceled. But we're talking about things that have been canceled or are canceled. And so I know a lot of you look at that and you're like, yep, canceled. That's how you spell it. And some of you are like, uh, isn't there supposed to be a second L? So where, who in here thinks that's spelled correctly? Raise your hand if you think it's spelled correctly. Okay, cool, 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 cool. Who in here thinks it's spelled wrong and it's offensive? Okay, here's a fun fact. I was kidding about the offensive part. Who thinks it's spelled wrong, like, but it's not offensive, just wrong? The spelling of canceled. Right? And what does it say? What does it say? But here's the thing. If you look it up, actually both ways are correct. So, yeah. So if you type canceled like that in Microsoft Word, you won't get the yellow, the red line. And if you, ca- if you add the second L, you won't get the red line. Either one works. And the, the rule is it has to be consistent across the document. Okay, so if you want to spell canceled like that on a letter, it's fine. And then on a book report, you spell it with two L's, that's fine too. But if you mix them, then it's wrong all the time. So consistency is key. Let's pray. I'm just kidding. That's not my message tonight. Anywho, hey, so um, I just got off on that pretty early on, and I was going to introduce myself for anybody who's new. My name is Brandon. I'm the youth pastor here. Um, I'm so excited that you're here tonight. Would love to connect with you afterwards so that you can tell me everything you loved about Collective and all the things that we should change. I'm fine with either of those. So uh, let's, let's chat. Find me afterwards. I'd love to connect with you. Uh, a little deeper. Tonight, we are starting this new series called Canceled, and I feel like there's never been a more appropriate series for 2020 because at some point, in some way, shape, or form, everything has been or is canceled. It's kind of like that second L. We just canceled it, and I think that's probably what they were doing. But anyway, has anybody been affected by something that's been canceled? Like, yeah, everyone's, people not raising their hands is because, like, you're like, I don't have to. You know the answer is yes. It's obviously yes. So about um, maybe two years ago, I was going to do this relay race called the Ragnar. And um, the Ragnar is pretty cool. This one was going to be in Napa Valley, California. And it's a 200-mile relay race on foot. Okay, so it takes 48 hours. You, like, ride in this van with all these stinky people. And you sleep in the van. And it's miserable. But at the end of it, you're like, dude, we just ran 200 miles. And so I was so excited about this race, right? We booked our plane tickets. We had a hotel room for the nights that we weren't sleeping in the van. I bought new running shoes, and I was breaking them in. You know, I was getting my miles. And uh, then all of a sudden, I heard on the news about this small fire that started in Napa Valley, California. And I was like, oh, man, that's terrible. That's not going to be good. And then the next night on the news, I heard how that fire had gotten bigger. And the next night, it had gotten bigger and bigger until most of Napa Valley Uh, had experienced these fires and was burned, like all of the vineyards, so many people's property, like it was, it was burned to the point, well, I'll get to that later. So unfortunately, our run got canceled. They're like, hey, we're not going to do this. And also, uh, we don't have the money to refund you, so we can give you part of your money back. We're sorry. And so we had these plane tickets that were non-refundable, this hotel room. So we went on vacation to San Francisco, but we did not get to run in this race because it was canceled. And so we got, uh, we went to Napa Valley anyway to like hang out, check it out, see all the things. And they actually said that because the fires were so bad that if, if you were to taste wine from Napa Valley uh, this year, 2020, or next year, you would actually taste the smoke from two years prior. That's crazy, right? It's crazy to think that like something that big canceled something and then like you can feel the effects of it years and years later. And so I think that tonight, as we look at, like, things that have been canceled or things that are canceled, like, those types of things, like, oh, my race got canceled, my graduation got canceled, my prom got canceled, those things are lame and no one likes it, right? But that's not really what we're talking about tonight. We're going to talk about a worse kind of canceling, and that's when we cancel people. 
and we cancel each other. And I think that our world right now is a bit quick to do that. We've seen it with um, anybody who says the incorrect thing on the news, like you accidentally say something wrong, like you're just canceled forever. You know, anytime we don't want to lean in and figure out someone else's side of the conversation and we just cancel, like on Facebook right now, I don't know if you guys see a whole lot of political stuff because you're not old enough to vote really, but like right now there are people literally in my friend's feed that are like, if you vote this way, just unfriend me now. Right? It's like, if you vote different than me, you're canceled. If you think different than me, you're canceled. And it's gotten so bad that it's like to the point where even if you look different than me or, or believe different than me or, or like different music than I do, you're canceled. And that's the world we live in. The thing about it is sometimes we need to cancel things, right? So we're, as we dive in, we're going to talk about a few terms that I think we should all kind of define. The first one is this, to call out, to call out. All right, so to call out means that we publicly hold somebody to a standard. We publicly hold them accountable for something harmful they said or did. Anybody ever feel like you personally have needed to be called out for something that you said or did, right? And you got people in your life that love you enough to say like, hey, that was dumb, don't do it. And you're like, okay, yeah, you're right, cool. Like that's a healthy call out. But with each of these terms comes a question, right? And the question for that one is this. Is it possible that as a people we've become a bit too eager to call out or point out people's mistakes? You're like, whoa, dude, come, let's calm down a little bit. Like, let's not get real right off the top. You're like two minutes into this thing. Come on. Is it possible that we become too eager to point out others' mistakes? The second thing is this, shame. Shame is to mock, embarrass, or humiliate somebody. And this could be anything from posting a, a meme about them or, or, or posting their private information on a public display. It's when we do something to hurt others. And in those moments, we should feel ashamed of ourselves. But the question is, do we have the right to hurt or be cruel to people we are angry at or disagree with? Do we have the right to publicly shame somebody for something that, that we don't agree with? And the last thing is this, cancel. All right, so to cancel is to boycott someone you believe needs to be held accountable for something they said or did. All right, excuse me, dry throat because I have not had any water today. I promise that's what. All right, boycotts can be, they're important, right? Sometimes we can boycott or cancel something that is harmful, that is offensive, that is wrong or broken, and we can affect positive change in that. But the question is, how do we balance accountability with grace and forgiveness? Because Jesus calls us to a different standard. He calls us to lead with grace, not like leadership, like in my leadership, I'm going to be graceful. That's important too. But by lead with grace, I mean that it is our first instinct, our first move, our first decision is grace. See, these terms can be a little bit confusing, but they're sometimes used interchangeably. And, and some people use it as a joke, right? Like, oh my gosh, you like pineapple on your pizza? Canceled. Oh my gosh, you like Taylor Swift? Canceled. You know how many times I've been canceled because of Taylor Swift? I'm, I'm, she's my ride or die, guys. You can cancel me all you want. I'm a, I'm a Swifty for life. I don't care who knows the internet. Thank you. Thank you. All right. But sometimes we cancel things and they fuel this drama. Like even, even like the uh, we can cancel celebrities and like fuel this drama party. Like the hashtag Chris Evans is over party. Like who would cancel Chris Evans? Seriously, he's one of the greatest superheroes of all time. Right? The human torch. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm just kidding, guys. That was a horrible movie. He was Captain America. I know that, okay? And other people call out or cancel things for legitimate reasons, right? Like especially public figures who need to be held accountable for something very harmful. There's a place for that. There's a reason for that. And sometimes, man, that's the, that's the move. But sometimes it's, we just go too far. You see, calling out, shaming, and canceling are all a little different. But where they meet is what we call this cancel culture, okay? And that's where all these things just sort of rule our life and run our life. Man, you say one thing wrong, you're canceled. It's over. So as you hear this, let me ask you this question. Do you think it's safe to say that we've, we live in a world that's gone a little overboard with canceling? No, no hey, cancel culture is usually about what, like, it's usually about what happens online or like these big corporate things, but we like, we do that in our offline relationships a bit as well, right? Like with or without the internet, we can sometimes be really critical or judgmental or impatient or uncaring or cruel. Am I 
Anybody like want to no? know? Okay, cool. No, we'll move on. It's fine. Uh, but for the next few weeks, we're going to talk about kind of four, uh, four people that we have a tendency to cancel that we should actually love and that we should love even probably to a, a different level. Like we should love them uh, with an unlimited kind of love, the, the love that Jesus love, uh, showed for us. Um, so it's not really easy to admit that we're capable of being cruel to people. Um, so I'm going to go first, okay? Um, there are plenty of people that I've canceled in my past, and I'm not super proud of it. But one of them I can remember is this dude named Eric. And uh, when I started out in uh, student ministry, I was like an intern. I worked for literally no money, like zero dollars. And uh, he was doing the same thing side by side. Like we were working together. And we actually were friends uh, in high school. So we knew each other really well. Um, we had an apartment together. We, like we were friends. We were tight. Um, and Eric did something really stupid, really dumb, and uh, kind of lost all of that. Like, he, he was asked to step down from the internship. Um, it went a lot farther than that. Uh, and I had an opportunity, you know, I had an opportunity to show him grace and show him love or to cancel him. And I, I canceled him. I was, like, scared of what was going to happen if I was associated with this dude. So I was just like, hey, man, I, we can't. We can't be friends anymore. Sorry, peace out. Uh, you can have until Tuesday to move your stuff out. And it was like, just like that, you know, it was done. This relationship that I had built over so many years, all of a sudden I was just like, hey, we're done here. This is canceled. And I'm not going to take away from what he did. Like, it was really dumb. And what happened to him was the right decision. But what I, how I responded and how I treated him personally outside of that was not. Um, I had an opportunity to, to help him rebuild his life and rebuild uh, his ministry, and I, I chose not to do that. And I still regret that to this day. Um, honestly, I do. He actually lived 20 minutes away from me when, when I was in Colorado. Like, he ended up there. I ended up there. What are the odds? Like, and nothing. I never, we never even talked. So we do this, right? Like, have you ever avoided or hated somebody because they were different than you? Like, let's, we can be honest in a room here, like, a little bit if you want. Yeah, cool. Thank you. There's some people that are, yeah, you know, like, we've all done it. Maybe it's a celebrity or a public figure who, who stood for things that you don't like. Or maybe it's a former friend, like in my case, and it was after you couldn't seem to agree on something that honestly seemed important, but maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was a family member or a classmate with opinions that you disagreed with. Or a neighbor or peer who seemed different, weird, or even kind of scary, right? Everyone's got like a weird neighbor at some point. I had a string of them, guys. My neighbors now are awesome. I'm never moving. I hope they never move either. If they do, I'm just going to cry. I'm like, please don't go. Anyway. Or sometimes we have a problem with like someone's culture. You know, like we look at them and we're like, I don't get that. I don't know. Canceled, right? This makes us feel uncomfortable. And so I'm going to tell you a little secret. This is not a new concept. Okay, this is not something that we invented. It's not something that's even uh, exclusive to our time. It, it's been happening for years and years and years. And as you know, I'm always going to start there. Then we're going to talk about the Bible. So guess what? This is that transition point. We're talking about the Bible. Cancel culture started way back in the day. Way back in the day. All right, in Jesus' time, people were often canceled for so many reasons. It was by society because either they sinned, they got sick. Like, right? Like, oh, you're sick. Gross canceled. They were poor or disabled, like people who were born disabled from birth, and they'd be like, yeah, no, canceled. Like, what? Or we're from a different cult uh, country or culture. And that might sound horrible, but how often do people today get angry or even violent towards people with a different skin color, political view, gender, religious belief? Far too often, right? Far too often. And so during Jesus's time, there was this major rift between these two people. On one side, you had the Jewish people, they're like, we're God's chosen people. And the truth is they were. But they were God's chosen instrument to bring his, his uh, grace and his love and his mercy to the whole world. But instead of sharing that, they kept it for themselves and like, oh, we're God's chosen people and you're not and everybody else is canceled. Mm, sorry. And on the other side of it, you had the Samaritans. The Samaritans were from a physically different country. They, were, uh, they worshiped in a different way, but it was a neighboring city. All right, so picture the kind of, of rival you see between like Yankees fans and Red Sox fans. All right. They're both, different. yeah, no. What about Coke people versus Pepsi people? Where's the Coke people at? Yeah, I'm a Coke person. Where's the Pepsi people at? How many people know that Mountain Dew trumps all of it? Yes. All right, all right. All right, how about this one? How about this one? Listen, you're going to like this one, guys. How about this one? Cowboys fans versus people who like winning. Winning. 
or like Iowans versus Nebraskans. Yeah, it was like that, but it was way, way worse, okay? It was way worse. And so during Jesus' time, there's this major rift between these two people, and it's like because of major differences between them that made to major disagreements. I think if social media had existed back then, the post between Jews and Samaritans would have been intense. Like the ethnic and cultural differences made them distrust each other, all right? Their political differences made them angry at each other, and their religious differences made them hate each other. So for hundreds of years, you would never, ever see a Jew and a Samaritan interact. Under no circumstances would it happen. Literally, if one was on fire, the other wouldn't even spit on them, okay? Like it's not not going to happen. So you wouldn't see them interact at all, let alone have a respectable conversation about their differences in customs and beliefs. But then this guy, Jesus, shows up, and he's a Jew, okay? One of God's chosen people. He was actually God's chosen person, right? And if, you're, uh, if you want to read along tonight, we're going to read in John chapter 4, all right, and starting in verse 10. But I'm going to give you a little bit bit of background. So what's happening here is like you've got this dude named Jesus, right? And he's leaving Jerusalem uh, to head to another town. Oh, sorry, he's leaving Judea to go to Galilee. To get from one to the other, they actually had to pass through Samaria. All right, so it's awkward enough. There's probably this one road, and everyone's like, all right, road, eyes front, don't look, don't look to the left, don't look to the right. Somebody comes to just walk around them, like, same thing, get the donkey, let's go. All right, like that's how it was. So they're headed through there. They get there, they're going through Samaria. They come upon this well, and Jesus decides, hey, this is a good spot to take a rest and get some water, right? Anyway, so Jesus says to stop and get some water. And what's happening is uh, at this point, the, the apostles are like, cool, he's going to chill and get some water. We can go into the town. We can get some food. We'll get some Jimmy John's and we'll bring it back. And he's like, sweet, that sounds great. They are freaky fast. And so they're like, yeah, they're freaky fast. We can get out of here freaky fast. And he's like, yeah, it's cool. Just go get the sandwiches. I'm going to stay here. So he's just like sitting there by this well. They're on their way to get the food. And the Samaritan woman comes to the well and Jesus looks at her and he says, hey, can I get a drink from the well? Like literally she's like, she's got the bucket. She's coming to get water and he's just sitting there. She's, he's like, hey, can I get a drink? And she's like, yeah, can I have, you're getting water. Can I have a drink? And she's like, do you, what are you, am I getting punked right now? She's like, do you know that you're like, you're, and we're, and I'm, you, Okay. And this is what happens, starting in verse 10. Jesus answered her. So she's like, whoa, whoa, why are you asking me for a drink? And Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him for a drink, and he would have given you living water. He's like, can I get a drink? She's like, uh, do you know what you're saying? And he's like, yes, but if you really knew, then you'd ask me to get a drink. And she's confused, right, because he, it'll say in here. She answers him. She says, sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, not a pencil like a bucket. And the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock? She's like, dude, you don't even have a bucket. Are you crazy right now? You're talking to a Samaritan woman telling me you're going to get water from this well without a bucket. You must be lost your mind. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water, the well water, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Wait, what? The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. She's like, okay, dude, let's see it. Get the water. Go ahead. And he, he told her, go and get your husband and come back. Weird request. Okay. I have no husband, she replied. Again, this is a weird conversation all of a sudden. It's gone very different than water. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. She's probably like, I, I know that. Like, what? Of course, that's why I said it. The fact is that I've had five husbands. He says, the fact is you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. She's like embarrassed, like, you. I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worship on the mountain, but you Jews claim that the place we must worship is in Jerusalem. So she's trying to change the subject. She's like, oh, I see. Okay, you're a prophet, but let's talk about something else. Like, should we worship on this mountain or should we worship over there where the temple is? Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming 
and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. And the woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. She's like, he's going to answer all the questions. We're going to figure it out. We're going to settle this thing that's going on between the Jews and the Samaritans. And one of us is going to be right. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, am he. He's like, hey, I'm, I'm that guy. You're looking to the future, but I'm here now. And she was like, what? That's weird. Not really, so she didn't say that. And so in this conversation, we've got this man, Jesus, who's saying these things about water and living water and all that kind of stuff. And what does it mean and, and things like that. But here's, here's what I want us to focus in on tonight. If you want to dig into the theology of the conversation, I'd love to have a one-on-one -on -one talk with you about what all these words mean. It'd be super fun. I'd be down for it. But tonight, here's what I want you to notice. I want you to notice Jesus in this conversation. I want you to notice what was going on, right? Like the tension. We don't talk to those people. We don't associate with those people. We don't act like those people. We don't go where those people are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That was going on in the background. But what Jesus is doing in the foreground is simply incredible. In this conversation, Jesus rose above the social and religious restrictions of the day. According to those customs, uh, it would have been controversial enough for a respectable man like Jesus to speak with an unmarried woman as if she were an equal. So we've got Jesus talking to an unmarried woman. Would have been bad enough, people would have raised eyebrows, asked questions, even if she was Jewish. But a Samaritan unmarried woman, it's like, no, sir, we do not behave that way. That is unbecoming. But despite their differences, Jesus and the Samaritan woman both did something remarkable. First, Jesus valued her. Jesus valued her. See, although Jews were accustomed to dismissing and hating Samaritans, Jesus never dismissed or was cruel to her. Instead, he valued her enough to start a conversation with her, treat her with respect, and share with her the good news that would change her life. He was, he was telling her that she has access to God, to eternal life, to the kingdom of heaven. He was giving her a way in to God's chosen people. And in kind, she valued Jesus. You see, although Samaritans were accustomed to dismissing and hating Jews, this woman valued Jesus enough to give him a drink of water, to listen and learn from him and tell others what she learned from him. Imagine how things could change if we acted this way with the people we don't like or who, are, who we seriously disagree with. You see, everyone would have expected Jesus to either ignore this woman completely or condemn her for having multiple relationships like that. But by choosing to love and embrace and value her, Jesus challenged his followers to love people who are different instead of rushing to cancel them. In fact, when his, when his followers came back, they're like, what is he doing? Like, Jesus, what in the world? Like, we gotta get you out of here. And he's like, no, we're gonna hang out. Like, we're gonna stay, we're gonna sit with these people, we're gonna talk to them, we're gonna learn from them, we're gonna love them, and we'll get to the sandwiches later. So here's what happens, verse 39. It says, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of that woman's testimony. She said, he told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man is really the Savior of the world. Because a Jewish man and a Samaritan woman were willing to cross party lines, many, many, many came to know Jesus that day. So can I tell you that your conflict might not be about you? Your struggle with people might not be about you, but might be for them or for the people that are watching. Man, when someone throws something up in your face that, that you want to just lash out and punch them for like, do you know that people are watching? And when we respond with love, you know what that can do in the life of that individual who's probably hurting and broken and angry at something totally different and what it can do in the lives of those that are observing. Like, do you know how much power you have? Whether you follow Jesus or not, there's this passage uh, in the book of Timothy that I think we can all learn from. And it's this, it says, um, it's about one of the, the early church leaders named Paul. He's writing this letter to Timothy, who was a young man that he was mentoring. 
And this is one of the things he told him. It's in, it's in 2 Timothy 4, verse 2. It says this, preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. You see, Paul's warning warning Timothy that people tend only to believe or listen to things they want to hear. And that's true inside the church and outside. It's true in my life. Sometimes I'd like to say less than, than always, but usually... You know, I, I want to hear what I want to hear. We prefer, we prefer it that way, right? It's comfortable. It, it's, it's easy. No one to challenge us. No one to tell us that we're wrong. No one to push us to be better. We, we like to hang around people who like the things we like or think or talk like we do, behave like we behave or believe what we believe. And that's, there's not necessarily anything wrong with that most of the time. But where it can go wrong is when we only spend people, time with people that are just like us. Because then we forget to value people who are different than us. And when we only learn from people who we agree with, that means we don't really learn anything at all. I saw this commercial. I can't remember what it was for or what it was. Uh, I think it's actually a Saturday Night Live skit. Yeah, they're like, oh, we're going to make this bubble. It's like we're turning Brooklyn into the bubble. And in the bubble, only certain type of people are there. And there's this flashes to this coffee shop, right? And there's these two people sitting at the table. And one's like, I mean don't you think? And the other one's like, absolutely. And it goes back. It's like, right? I know. Exactly. I couldn't agree with you more. And that was it. The whole bubble was just like people agreeing with each other. And it was like, gross. It was weird. You see, the Jews and the Samaritans both believed that God was okay with them ignoring and hating each other because they surrounded themselves with people who believed that too. They continued to be comfortable with that belief. But when Jesus crossed dividing lines to have a conversation with a woman who was different than him, he helped both sides see just how wrong they had been all along. Through their conversation, Jesus challenged both the Jews and the Samaritans to love the people who are sometimes the hardest to love, people who are different than us. Our neighbors who may not share our culture, values, behavior, skin color, language, or belief. Through his example, Jesus calls each of us to do the same, to love the people who aren't like you. Love the people who aren't like you. See, these two groups of people had tons of differences in their culture. But did you notice that Jesus didn't seem interested in talking about any of those differences or expecting the Samaritan woman to come Jewish? Like, she's like, hey, which one of these is right? And he's like, let me just tell you what's right. Like, let me tell you what matters. She's like, do we have to worship here or there? He's like, you just worship me. Do we have to worship this way or that way? He's like, you just have to worship me. She's like, no, no, but is it Jerusalem or Samaria? He's like, it's Jesus. And she's like, is it, is, it like, is it like expository or topical? And he's like, it's Jesus. You may not know what those words are. If you ever go to Bible college, you'll figure it out. It doesn't matter. It's Jesus. Is it black or white? It doesn't matter. It's Jesus. Is it pop music or rock music? It doesn't matter. It's Jesus. You see, guys, there are more Jesus followers all over the world in every culture and skin color speaking more languages than you can even name. And even within the same country, city, or church, you're going to find followers of Jesus who worship different than you, who think different than you, who pray different than you, who talk different than you, who who vote different than you, and act different than you. And it's more than okay. It's actually a really, really good thing. We're all united in Jesus, but being united doesn't mean we have to be the same. It means we are loved the same. And it means we all have the same access to God through Jesus. This is actually really good news, right? So, man, if you're not there tonight, if you haven't come to that that place where it's like, it's Jesus and nothing else, man, I want to invite you tonight to take that step. During our worship time, I would challenge you to go find a coach. Come find myself. I'll be right down front, like, if you want to talk about, like, what does it mean to, to make that move, to, to cross that line and come to know Jesus for real, man, I would love to have that conversation with you. Maybe you're there, okay? And, and when I started talking about loving people that, that aren't like you or that you don't really like, like, like some names came to mind. You're like, real quick. Like, I'm like, love the people that are hard to love. You're like, oh, dude, let me tell you about the, this one girl or this one boy. And you're like, can I get the mic? No, you cannot. 
someone came to mind, right? It's easy to think of people that we don't necessarily like. Like for me, when I talk about this, the joking, my joking answer is like people that drive too slow in the fast lane. Oh, right. But somebody came to mind or a group of people came to mind or like a class like, oh, fifth grade science or fifth period science. I hate all of them. So here's what we're going to do tonight. I want to challenge you this week to find a practical, tangible way to love that person or that group of people. Find a practical, tangible way to get yourself in front of people that are not like you, that you find a hard time loving, and do something loving for them.